Oh, that will come soon enough. I won't, I won't take everyone's time too much. Um, today we'll be talking about Joomla and Hypermedia APIs. What is Hypermedia? How is it being used today? And sort of the future of what we think is uh, Hypermedia. A little bit about myself. Uh, my name is uh, Robert Jacoby. I am the president of Arc Technology Group. We are a Chicago US based consulting firm who just celebrated our 16th anniversary. Uh, so we've been using Mambo and Joomla for a very, very long time. So sort of by the numbers, oops, if I can remember what these numbers say. <laughs> 20 plus years in uh, content management. We've built our own content management systems. We've used Mambo and Joomla all the way through and through. So 15, now 16 years of uh, Arc Technology Group where we uh, work primarily with mid to enterprise size companies. And then, of course, over 10 years now of uh, working with Joomla and Joomla celebrating its anniversaries, but an anniversary year since last year. Uh, so that's been very exciting for us. Just a little bit of contact info, and so this will be the last really important slide about it. <laughs> so if you want to follow us, reach us, uh, contact me after the uh, presentation or during uh, the breaks. So for today, as I mentioned, we'll be talking about sort of the history of hypermedia. Uh, we'll be talking about how is it being used today, and of course uh, the future, or you know, our vision and what we think of uh, the direction of what hypermedia is and how it will be uh, utilized going forward. A little bit about the history. Uh, hypermedia is actually a very, very old concept. So back in the uh, early 20th century, Paul Butlet, I think he was French off the top of my head, uh, was looking to describe library systems and communications and data and structures. And he had the notion of radiant, radiant information everywhere. Uh, that is, he had a vision of a great network of knowledge centered on documents, including the notions of hyperlinks, search engines, um, so on and so forth. Uh, subsequent to that, uh, Vannevar Bush, uh, worked at Memex and was working with data storage. And he had an idea that wholly new forms of encyclopedias would appear, where content would be a mesh of associative trails between information. Uh, then Engelbert, who worked for the US government, and NLS, and DARPA, creating sort of the first precursors of what we know now as today, the internet, as well as uh, Apple with its HyperCard platform, which really kind of kicked off being able to move information back and forth really easily with user interfaces, texts, and other media. Uh, what is hypermedia today? Uh, anyone know who oops, this guy is? <coughs> no? <laughs> okay, we got one, Tim Berners-Lee, yes. So he, he's sort of the modern inventor of the internet, and uh, but uh, He's not the inventor of hypermedia, so that's you know, the difference. He was able to take the hypermedia concepts you know, that had been worked on for almost 100 years and turn it into a structure that we could all use. So that was really hypertext, and we're calling it hypermedia as well. Uh, a nice little formal definition of hypermedia. Everyone can read that. Uh, it's right out of Wikipedia. The non-linear uh, medium of information which includes graphics, audios, et cetera, et cetera. So the key point being non-linear. So data can come from multiple different areas uh, in different calls and then re be repackaged together into something useful and structured. Uh, but you know, from an implementation perspective, uh, it's now about a bunch of different little things. So we like to start with, it's hyper small. A lot of content that we see today in sort of the hyper media space is small bits of content being exchanged, small uh, things from items and products to bits and pieces of articles. So moving forward, content is getting smaller and smaller actually in a hyper media space. Uh, content is getting faster. So with smaller content, you can move it around more quickly, put it together back and get the content you're looking to expect. So it's hyper fast. So we have hyper small, hyper fast. And with these uh, 
infrastructures in place, now it's hyper, hyper. So now it's, you can scale and perform uh, with content from many different sources, put them together, and it keeps growing and growing and scaling and scaling. So let's compare this to something we already know and use in the real world. Uh, water, I don't know why I'm keeping this behind me. <laughs> so water is everywhere, it's like the forest. It surrounds us, it permeates us, it's part of us. Uh, but, you know, little facts about just water, uh, that more fresh water is below ground than above ground. So we see little trickles and bits of it, uh, little content pieces almost. 75% uh, uh, of the Earth's surface is uh, water and roughly 70% of a human being is actually water as well. And we have you know, a full ecosystem around water, obviously. There's clouds, there's rain. Water flows in a, in a very circular format. It evaporates uh, and continues to spread uh, around the world. And there's even smart water, so, <laughs> which is just a brand. So like water content, uh, follows a lot of the uh, same systems in our uh, mind. Uh, back in 2010, uh, Google stated that we create as much information in two days now as we did from the dawn of man through 2003. So it's an amazing amount of content, water that has to be accounted for and utilized. Uh, that, and there's a similar content ecosystem that we see growing uh, where content flows in a circular format. Um, according to uh, computer giant IBM, there are 2.5 exabytes of data generated every day in 2012. So that includes video, uh, text, everything um, that we really see uh, online. And a good 75% of that data is fully unstructured. So just p bits and pieces that are being put together uh, at a client end. Uh, in the Joomla world, we kind of know this as one giant chunk, the article editor page. We have content that goes through images, text, and it's all put together in one giant article as opposed to being um, unstructured. It's actually quite structured within an article because you're putting it all together. There's uh, design, HTML already built into the content. So there's a lot of structure around that. Uh, I will take questions at any point for one, just lest I forget. Um, so that's sort of just a little quick baseline of you know, the way we're thinking about hypermedia and content going forward in the future. Uh, one of the things we like to talk about as well is, you know, before we get into some more technical uh, nitty gritty, is you know, what do you do with all this content? So we like we to talk about planning for content. So planning for content is understanding you know, everything from a target audience to frequency of communication, you know, what are calls to action, uh, defining success, and you know, of course growth with that content. With regards to audiences, I'm generally looking at what are they interested in? You know, why are they coming to the website? Are demographics important? And when are they coming to your website? Again, these are you know, external concepts around content, but help us define how we use content in a hypermedia fashion. You know, frequency is this you know, hourly, daily, monthly, you know, how long? Uh, do you wait to update content? How long is it being updated from other sources? <laughs> Looking at the success of that content. You know, is it generating the sales you want? Do you want uh, social media click-throughs, uh, retweets, uh, follow-throughs? Do you want it, uh, do you want engagement to be actually offline? Do you actually want that content to somehow generate uh, a response that's via a phone call or mail? And then we, we evaluate content with regards to how we want to continue growing it. So are we having a cycle of responding to what the customer needs via content? Again, you know, what are the data sources of that content? How is that content being utilized? Uh, do we have what the customer desires? And adapting to what the customer wants. So it's a, yeah, on the content sort of strategy portion of this, it's just really understanding from beginning to end and then closing the circle. Because once you understand you know, how you want to grow with that content, you push it back into the system and replan for uh, frequency and audience and all that. But a lot of times content is just a giant fire hose of information. Uh, there's a lot of data to deal with all the time and a lot of times it's locked in and uh, very fixed in you know traditional CMSs with lots of structure and a lot of the content is just going in one direction. You know, this is a typical, I think it's actually Joomla 
2.5 database, tons of SQL, tons of databases, and to access a lot of that content, especially uh, in the little more locked-in systems, you're building extensions, things that have to talk with the database directly. So before it was a direct MySQL queries, now you're using uh, Joomla database objects, but it's still you're talking directly to the database. And it's used internally and externally. So, of course, you're going to have the same kind of issues whether you're doing internal communications, uh, dealing with permissions, you know, on an intranet, as well as externally with general information, sales information, uh, e-commerce, obviously a, a very good example. So again, to restate the problem, uh, all of our modern content management systems uh, really look at putting a whole bunch of content in very structured formats uh, within that CMS and kind of locking it into that. So Joomla, Drupal, WordPress, uh, even better examples like Medium or Squarespace, those are really locked in sources of content. Um, but as the communication you know, across the internet grows, we need to be able to exchange content between other services, between different types of clients and systems. Other, like other services actually want to be able to access content, you want to access their content. We see that with small little things like being able to set out you know, Twitter feeds from a lot of the marketing communication so uh, software packages like HubSpot or taking that content and pushing it out to email. Um, how can we have better communication uh, back and forth? So we start with some uh, solutions. Uh, so content is now being split up and made smaller, more hyper. Uh, in the Joomla world, we have content construction kits, and it's nothing new. Drupal's had those as well. Uh, we have, you know, AMP that's slowly kind of doing its thing. We'll see where that goes on the Joomla, in the Joomla world. And then uh, lastly, real hypermedia APIs. Uh, how many people have actually used a CCK on Joomla anywhere? That's not bad. That's actually good. And then mostly for shopping carts, are actually real singular content. So maybe for a press release where you actually split up all the pieces for a title, the mm -hmm. source, the address. Mm -hmm. so, so. But most probably around e-commerce for a lot of these solutions to be able to manage items or products. Um, common ones that are sort of CCK or directory services, we have Sayblood, Flexi Content, K2, Zoo, Sobe Pro. I don't know if I'm missing any of the big CCKs. Zoo, Zoo yeah. Form to content. Which one? Form to content. Form to content. I don't know if anyone's ever heard that. Missed that one. <laughs> I should try. <laughs> um, so one thing that's very nice about CCKs is you can actually start making your content more hyper by breaking that apart. So instead of utilizing uh, just an article to display, you can actually use the CCK article, which is actually broken out into many, many different pieces. So not just title and the author and the whole body of the content, but now we can really start to split it up and say, uh, you know, line one is a title, there's a subtitle, there's an author line, and having many, many fields to break that content up. When on any article page in Joomla, we can all of a sudden decide which pieces of that uh, data we can, we want to uh, deploy. So some of that's reused and shared content. And it takes us, you know, that first step towards making smaller, more hyper accessible content. Would you include using schema.org and, and wrapping it in this media? Uh, so, the uh, question is, because I don't know if they'll get it, is uh, would we include schema.org and wrapping them around? So, like mm -hmm. uh, microservices or micro. Uh, Data integration. Microdata, thank you. Uh, yes, but usually in the case of microdata, it's still, in Joomla world, it's still sitting in one giant chunk. In a perfect world, you're taking that mic those portions of that microdata and actually having them in separate. Fields and then wrapping them around microdata when you get to the so article that's portion. Google's doing when it then uses it to reach the Correct. So that's what Google's doing because they already have that structure then and they can take advantage of that in uh, whatever form. Uh, has anyone else uh, used microdata service uh, on the Google side? Yeah. Everyone's using Probably primarily for addresses because that's yeah. usually one of the better ones to use it for. But there are uh, you know, probably 200,000 million uh, schemas that you can actually use for very specific things from a doctor's office to a restaurant to uh, movie, uh, film data, it's, uh, and you can go to schema.org to find and search for the exact kind of microdata services. Probably for Google, it's really the other way around because when they actually index content, it's all about and microdata and some break it up into sensible pieces. Correct, yeah, so that's what we're trying, yeah, so 
uh, I mean, the, the beauty of the microdata is you, you're doing the work for Google. Yeah. And we'll actually see that. That's really what uh, AMP is as well. It's just another protocol for uh, making Google's life easier. So when they crawl your page, they don't have to think so hard. They can get rid of a few uh, a server racks. And uh, they can take that and then utilize it in their search results better. In contrary, I was speaking to someone in the last uh, day, uh, Google will not rank your site better just because you have AMP. If you have garbage data in AMP, it'll still be garbage data in Google. Google does not actually sit there and say, just because you have AMP, you're more important. You still need to have relevant, meaningful data. It just makes their life easier. And all things given equal, an AMP site versus another site, all the content is the same. In that case, then you're going to have probably the AMP being bumped up slightly. Um, but AMP is not you know, the be all and end all of uh, managing content with Google. Um, and there are, I think, already one or two uh, Google AMP plugins, even though it's not in core yet. Yes. Or if it will be in core ever. <laughs> Following those threads is sometimes uh, challenging. Uh, any questions on CCKs and how we're thinking about making content smaller and more manageable? And how, you know, again, I hope everyone out here starts thinking about making content smaller and more manageable. Uh, sort of back to our uh, water <laughs> analogy. We have rivers of information, content everywhere flowing. Uh, you know, how are we going to be looking at this? Uh, in fact, uh, oh yeah, my favorite slide. The slide in picture left blank. Uh, so what's that? Um, actually, uh, one of the largest open source content management systems, Drupal, uh, Dries uh, Breitart has uh, a significant opinion on the matter. Uh, the question we have to answer is, do we stand to benefit from decoupling Dru uh, Drupal? So the thinking behind that is, uh, for uh, future versions of Drupal, will they be able to take a core that just manages the content, and all views and all layers really are just clients that interact with a core, mm -hmm. as opposed to being you know, directly embedded into the code base of the core. Even though a template in Joomla is, you know, is a type of extension, you're still building on the Joomla framework, with all the Joomla code, and then we see uh, to make that work. Uh, Dries is talking about really taking and splitting apart the fact that you would have a content server and anything else could talk to it. So it could be a Drupal front end system, it could be Laravel, it could be, it could be a Joomla front end if you have the right connectors and APIs talking to each other. So that go brings us into what we think of as hypermedia uh, APIs small content, fast content, served content. Um, does it also solve all sorts of problems with managing content and utilizing it? No, but it's a, it's a shared and common way for developers and site owners to make their content more accessible to the world. So typically we think of someone on a mobile phone or in a browser looking at a web page of content, but that's not the only way that content is being utilized. You may have products and services and items and other data that you would actually like other services to also integrate with themselves so that there's a way to communicate that data and information across the internet. Um, and, and another very important aspect of hypermedia APIs is to make sure that there's a way to communicate how you get that across. It's not enough to say I have an API and hide it away and hope something happens, but it's also freeing up the descriptions and the utilizations of those uh, APIs. Uh, typically hypermedia today is very simple. We're using REST, we're using JSON, we're using JavaScript uh, to make these calls and send information back and forth. And these things can be quite simple. I mean, we're looking at, you know, you have a stateless server, so stateless meaning just pretty much any web server, and it's just waiting for a request, something as simple as, you know, hello world, and you always get a response. That's the key. So even if uh, you don't want someone to look at that information, you have to give them a, a nice little failure so that communication is always bi-directional. And typically, uh, it includes what we call cruddly. Um, how many people know what just flat out crud is? Okay, so most people have just done the crud, so create, update, delete. What's important in the hypermedia REST uh, world is you also have the leap part, so you have to be able to list things that are in that database, or that's not, it's not a database anymore. It's a stateless server that has data. And whatever's behind that is actually unimportant in a hypermedia world. So, but you need to list uh, 
items, and then actually pull item information. So create, update, delete, list, and items. What's nice about Hypermedia APIs as well is you can enforce a lot of security at many different levels. So you can have a lot of security on the client application, not client side per se browser, but actually on the client application, workflows, code, processes. Then you can doubly secure those on the uh, stateless server side where you're passing the token or key that allows you to use that information and then other permissions uh, on top of that. Very scalable. Uh, one of the nice things about Hypermedia servers is that, or services, is that on the back end, sort of receiving data side of the universe, you can actually cache that content much more easily without <coughs> worrying cache, about caching front end client services. Those can be split up among other people, services, however, those, whatever your data and content needs are. And we talk about water, and it's pretty simple water cycle evaporate, rain, water on the ground. We feel that content has a very similar uh, structure in that uh, you know, there's a content developer, uh, that content gets pushed down to services, those services spread that content around, and then other developers can reuse that content. So we, we think of content as a very free-flowing uh, world, and uh, we believe that many services want to utilize these things across many, many clients. And the rest is Q&A, much shorter than I <laughs> thought. Uh, so we'd like you know, really to think about how people want to build a better, bigger, faster Joomla, utilizing content that's shared all over the world uh, that's useful uh, across all sorts of APIs and uh, clients. And beer is made of water. <laughs> so any questions? So what uh, the question is, have we ever implemented a sort of hypermedia API stack, for example, inside of Joomla? So we've used Joomla as a client for API stack. Um, we had a, a large uh, client install with uh, tens of thousands of assets, video, uh, images, but mostly text, being the scripters for all that. That was initially built on the actually Joomla framework. Uh, about two and a half years ago. We've actually gone around and now we're, we're rebuilding it on Node.js uh, because the JavaScript implement implementations make it easier to have data from the client being ported back and forth using uh, a more standard, uh, efficient uh, method. This JSON is just much cleaner uh, on the Node side. It's pretty, uh, it's much friendlier than on the PHP side to implement it, let's put it that way. Also, another great example of uh, hypermedia services is Foxycart. They're a shopping cart service, and they have a Foxycart API for building out your own e-commerce platform. And it's a, a pure hypermedia shopping cart system where you insert little bits of JavaScript on pages, and those bits of JavaScript actually call in the functions to be able to send uh, data back and forth between the Foxycart stateless server and your website. So you don't need build out something like Hikashop or uh, you know, Virtumark or any giant um, e-commerce shopping cart platform. It's all handled service side and you make calls to say, oh, Mary logged in. Uh, Mary added something to the cart. So those are all little small JavaScript functions that can handle on a stateless server and small little data gets back that says update cart uh, view with JavaScript to two, to three, to four. Do you have a, an example of that, for example, of a is Joomla doing that? So, okay, let's, uh, let's see how good the internet is. That's always a fun game. Oh, not seeing that there. So this is actually, so let me get this working over there. So this is actually the uh, client, uh, Hilco Industrial. 
they are, this is because the screen's small, it's being responsive and shrinking it. But this is a Joomla site through and through. Uh, and they do uh, distressed asset resales. So, for example, your factory may be going bankrupt, and you have millions of items that you want to sell. Um, all that data is stored in, right now, a Joomla framework server, which has uh, an API, a simple REST API that allows the data to go back and forth. So, every item on this page is just another request. First request might be, how many items can I show at a time? You get a list of 10 items. Scroll through the list of 10 items, display titles, uh, <coughs> grab the logos, um, and we can dive into one of these. And here we can see a number of assets that are for sale for this auction that are going to be taking place. Again, these are all on a totally separate uh, server running Joomla framework. Front end is all Joomla 3.5 whatever the latest version is, three, five, one, two. <laughs> Thank you. Um, if I click that. And then diving into any one of these sort of assets, uh, again, it's doing another separate call to get just get those pieces. So we've separated uh, the client and the view information really from all the data in a, in a very uh, separate way. So uh, the, the actual Server, uh, stateless server portion is on totally different infrastructure. It's able to scale uh, one way. The website can obviously scale on a higher level for just pure performance to grab things. Uh, we have caching implemented in the middle, so at certain calls, especially ones from uh, upcoming or excuse me, current sales, are automatically uh, cached on the front end. The server doesn't have to worry about caching the front end to actually cache that information if uh, necessary. And the internet here is terrible. Um, yes, please. Yeah, have you actually given much consideration to the age and death of the content? Um, because if you're using this sort of technology where you're disseminating the information from source to various different systems, the original builder of the content becomes is not, you know, if I show something on my website, I write it, it's mine, I can take it down. But if things are being shared in this way, you lose ownership very quickly and it all gets shared and shared and shared. The classic one is someone does something stupid at their Oxford graduation ceremony and then two years later an employee sees it, even though they've deleted all of their original content, the content doesn't die. So there's been several moves to try and make photos and various others have metadata that says, this should last for only six months. This should only. Are you building that into such systems? So the question is, how do you let content die if it's sitting on a you know, service somewhere else? Uh, the beauty of hypermedia is that the service owner can manage that internally. Mm -hmm. So you know, there's a creation date, a modified date. Six months after that, uh, make this unavailable. Return a false. On the client side, you can also do that as well because we've separated everything. So on the client side, you can say, well, it seems like these server guys leave everything up there forever. Um, I like to manage that, and I can only you know, do a rest call to get the latest content, so content in the last three months. So you can manage it at both ends. It actually gives control to both parties. Yes? Um, with, with a framework like this, with APIs, it's really easy um, to publish your parts data. So it's really structured data that you are publishing on the internet, which will also make it really easy for people to get all the information from your website and use it themselves. Well, what can you do about content theft with APIs? So the question is, uh, what can you do about content theft with APIs? The, the simplest is uh, control how you, you allow people to access that. So you can do that with you know, tokens and security uh, on the uh, server side of things. And this also allows for a lot of monetization, monetization of that content. So, uh, for example, Foxy Card, you want to use their API to start pushing things back and forth on a shopping cart. Uh, you need to pay. And once you stop paying, you can't access those uh, APIs anymore. So, this is a Foxy Card, and then if you manage products on their server, you manage it inside. So, you can do it on both sides. You can actually so, you can actually build an administrator on your side. You can build that as a client can build that as a client, or you can use, they also have a separate service, which is a client, okay. to their API. So the beauty of the, of the hypermedia world is that 
you have one you know core group of uh, functions and you know that controls the data and you can access it with all different types of clients assuming that's been made available to you. Don't like that client you can reload. Sure. Correct. that'll uh, allow you to be able to actually parse that content out uh, without having to uh, install a, a whole PCCK in, in the process. Um, on the nice Joomla side of things, I, the, my understanding is now that the RESTful API on the Joomla side has moved from 3.6 to 3.7, but it still should be coming out this year at some point to be able to access certain levels of content um, as that grows. I don't know if anyone, or if Jesse know better. <laughs> Chris is pushing that out, isn't it? Chris Davenport. Chris Davenport. Um, matching the 3.6 and 3.7, correct. Any other questions? Because what we really want everyone to start doing is making your content smaller, making it more accessible, um, monetizing it, if that makes sense, but being able to both go back and forth with content. So on the Joomla side, you know, those, those RESTful APIs come out, uh, you can push content out, but don't forget, uh, there are plenty of extensions and plugins that are slowly uh, allowing you to also pull things in. So anything from just using plain JavaScript within your content to access those APIs are actually uh, components and plugins uh, that help you get out there. Typically, we actually, uh, for very large things, build out a component that manages all of that um, on the Joomla side of things, and then plugins and little modules to actually do this sort of day-to-day -day grunt work for building out reviews. You mentioned that there was an integration between Joomla and Drupal. Uh, you could you could integrate that. That was actually done and very heavily documented. I can't remember the year, but it was actually on April first, whatever. That <laughs> <is>. <laughs> so the statement is that there was a there was a huge integration done between Joomla and Drupal, but it was on April first. Yes. It really doesn't matter what year if it was April first, does it? <laughs> yes. Uh, you speak about scalability. Yes. And, uh, does we have to prepare something to respect and uh, to make this uh, web service? Uh, well, so what's wonderful on the front end, you know what you're going to be doing. So it really depends on the provider of the content to make sure that they're scaling out their servers uh, correctly. But what's nice about it is that all the thin clients that talk to it have actually less work to do because the content calls are going out somewhere else. But as a provider, we need to have a special structure on that something? Just sort of typical internet, internet uh, structure to make sure that, you know, their data scales, and kind of, um, the actual application scales. Um, the nice thing is, again, you're not pulling, you know, usually tons of chunks from view code or multimedia. Uh, you know, we'll see in a typical enterprise uh, installation that uh, large media is being he held in uh, CDNs and blob storage elsewhere. Uh, there's the real data and core. So a lot of things are being pulled from different directions. Um, and that actually reduces any single point of failure. And there is tools for uh, for helping uh, developing uh, for REST or something like this. You can put a request and have the, the result or the structure. This, there is a uh, same tools or this, there is a so something for intermediate? Usually it depends on the actual provider of that content. For example, Foxycart, they use a lot of just JavaScript to be able to make those calls, so you can insert that wherever you want. On the you know, server end, if you're using Joomla, spit out article content uh, to other sources. You know, let's wait for the uh, RESTful API to be uh, fully implemented, and hopefully that'll be this year. George is also, I think, he's talking. Oh, George has talked about it, doing yes. APIs anyway. So yeah, there's, there's, there's going to be a couple of talks that sort of continue the the theme and process. And this is really just to make people start being more aware of what hypermedia is, not just having an article with just tons of stuff in it. It's really to make that content more useful. So generally, you're looking at uh, interacting with the SDPs. There's what the Chrome extension called as Postman. <coughs> used to what was the extension? Postman. 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 Mm -hmm. Yeah. Which you can use to you know interact with APIs, see what kind of responses, and uh, you can also save test cases on it. 
So if there is a new line solution that is giving you web services, you can use Postman to play with it before you actually start building one more. Yeah, it's a service of Okay. Any other questions? We'll have a wonderful day and beyond. <laughs> we'll be the first ones to launch.